Why are we here? How should we try to live? How do you see God? Great Mysteries of Life, tonight, on call with the Prairie Doc. Good evening, and welcome to On Call with the Prairie Doc. Humankind has struggled with many questions in the two million years or so that we've been around. Who are we? Why are we here? What is the future? And on and on. The discussion of these questions is a combination of science and philosophy. Religion and history also play a part in the search for answers. I don't know if we will answer any of these questions tonight, but we will certainly enjoy trying. First, let's take a look at this week's Prairie Doc quiz question. It is a pick the best answer question this week. A near-death experience, or NDE, is when after resuscitation or recovery, a person reports a common experience like an out-of-body feeling, going down a tunnel toward a warm light of peace and well-being, a sense of unconditional love and acceptance, and beings of light or reunion with deceased loved ones. This phenomena was described in one in the early 1500s by a painting by Hieronymus Bosch, two by French psychologist Victor Egger in 1890, three by Celia Green, who in 1968 described the out-of-body experience of 400 people, four by Raymond Moody, M.D., in 1975, who wrote a popular book outlining the phenomenon. Five, throughout the ages, from all human cultures. Or six, all of the above. Which is the best answer? We'll have the correct answer at the end of our program. We begin our quest for answers tonight with Dr. Dennis Bielfeldt a university professor and director of the Institute for Lutheran Theology. The question of being. Why is there anything at all and not merely nothing? What is the nature of being? Uh, the question of uh, doing. What ought I to do? What things could I do that are better than doing other things? Uh, the question of beauty. Uh, the question of truth. These all came from the, the Greek mind in the West. Now there were uh, other developments in other parts of the world, but uh, you know, in China they have a long tradition. India has a long tradition of uh, philosophical speculation. Pretty close to the same thing as the Greeks came uh, up with. Some of it's the same, although uh, in the Indian tradition, and I am talking about from India. India, yeah, from India, it's always been the question of uh, salvation has been a fundamental question. Uh, what can I do to be saved? And, they, and the, the question here of saving, when, when, you, when you hear the word saved, people oftentimes don't get it in the, uh, the deepest sense of what it meant. Uh, uh, to be saved is to be healed, actually. The, the, the term in the, in the Greek is the same, and the Latin is the same. Salus means to be healthy, sound, or uh, to, to be find saved. Health. Yeah. So is saved. Yeah. That's saved. very interesting. Yeah. So, wow. so healthiness and, and being saved is a part of the same thing. And of course, the question is uh, that the Greeks knew, and but the, the Indians knew very deeply, is that there's something fundamentally wrong about existence. They R thought. wrong about what existence. That existence is not the way it ought to be. That there is too much suffering and too much pain, and uh, that the world should go a different way than it goes, basically. Uh, and so, how ought we to live in a world that should have been different than what it is? You know, that that's kind of the question. How can we leave? How can we relieve suffering? How can we relieve suffering? How can we make our life better, the lives of others better? How can there be more? health in life, if you will, more spiritual health. And it, this is an interesting uh, term, too, the word spirit. You know, it's out of the Latin. It comes from spiritus. and to breath. Breath, yeah. So uh, really, the, the, the uh, healthiness of the spirit is basically, uh, you know, everything to do with uh, 
healthy breath of life, breath of life that is sound, is uh, salvific, that's a big word that theologians use, it means having to do with being saved, having to do with being put right, having to do with being made right, you know, rather than the way we are. See, because the fundamental question is, is the universe deeply the way it ought to be? You know? okay. I love the, the, the question of the spirit right. to me. That's one of the essence of religion and meaning to me. And I sense that uh, your spirit, which is this very interesting man, whenever I discuss things, there's a spirit of that's uh, there and my sense is that there is this spirit within me as well that right. is oh, yeah. a lot like my mother's spirit oh is that right? <laughs> yeah my father was a little bit more conservative my mother was <sighs> out Jeez, she was right. right out there but she oh, had uh, the spirit that you could tell was special right and uh, when she died then that was gone right and uh, i think isn't that what ancient man human women and men wondered the spirit is now gone where did the spirit go where did the spirit go yeah that that is such a good question right and, and it is a you know, fundamental question uh, about our mortality uh, whether there's anything of us that survives right know. the question and, of heaven in the question of heaven are you going to be saved and gone to heaven that isn't that what saved means contemporarily? Well, it means that in a lot of traditions. Now, I, I come out of the Lutheran tradition uh, okay. as a Lutheran uh, pastor uh, as well and the president of the Institute of Lutheran Theology, which there is this go. new uh, uh, graduate school and seminary that's right here in Brookings, South Dakota, uh, serving people across the nation. But, I mean, uh, does salvation happen somewhere else? Or does it happen here? Or does it happen there and here? See, uh, Lutherans would want to emphasize that, of course, the, the, to live in this life is to uh, live not yet at the other, but already yet in that the Jesus, and Christ has already been here. See, so that there is a sense in which we are already in uh, a resurrected ex existence, even though we're we still are alive. Still alive. So. Uh, some traditions try to wait and, and say that salvation is something completely outside of this sphere. Right. Yeah. And some Christians believe that, but it has to happen here and now as well, as in the great by and by, right? In the great by and by. Right. We've sung that. I know. Yeah, now, yeah. You know, that uh, reminds me. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, I've got a choral group that sings on yes, Tuesday beautiful. nights. Yeah, yeah. You've sung with me. Yeah, and not as much as I'd like. But it Dark. is a, a joy to me. And when I'm singing, something overwhelms yeah, me, right. fills me with a spirit yeah. that I cannot explain. Right. Now, you're a musician. Where is that spirit and music? How does that fit? You know, that is a great question. And uh, it's the question of beauty I sometimes like to connect it to the question of the more than us, you know. The more, uh, the what? More than us. The more more than, than us. There's us. something more, more than us. More than us. Yeah, more than us. N-E-S-S. -S. Yeah, more yeah. than us. Yeah, more than this, more than that. That there's something more. And the, it, it is, uh, it's, it's a pointer to perhaps our, the significance of what life is. I mean, because we live in a time uh, that is defined by a set of assumptions in philosophy and in contemporary culture that's quite different than the last century, uh, particularly the 19th century, which was an age of idealism, you know. But now we li live in an age of what I call physicalism and people and you. Physicalism. You, yeah, physicalism. All there is is the physical, and there are certain fundamental laws that operate on the physical and there are certain properties that are instantiated well, I don't want to get too technical here by objects they're physical objects and somehow all of this good stuff sort of develops out of this uh, these uh, motion of these fundamental particles so you have what's ever going on at the quantum level and then you got whatever's going on at the biochemical, the chemical level and the biological you're, level. You're and talking up, science. Yeah, right? up here and then finally we get to brains and then human beings are thinking things and somehow 
that all, the, the technical word here would be supervenes. It's all dependent upon what's going on in this uh, deepest level down here. And these experiences of beauty and music and question of God, they, they seem not to fit in very well with that, with that paradigm, stuff. does yeah. it? Right, <laughs> it? That's what I'm saying. It doesn't. It, do, it doesn't. There is a separation. Yeah. I mean, that's been a question of millennia. It, mm -hmm. it is science versus religion or, uh, you know, where is the togetherness in that? Right. Uh, and, and of course, uh, there is a foot, uh, this idea that they've always been in sort of warfare with each other, you know. Yeah. That, uh, science has come to slay religion. Yes. And religion is running away. And, you know, people don't know it, but when uh, Darwin first came out with his theory, I mean, all kinds of Anglican clerics uh, in, in Britain thought, it, this is great stuff, you know. They didn't see it as a threat to uh, religion. And in fact, uh, uh, I don't think modern science could ever have developed outside a tradition that believed that God was at work in the world and that it was ultimately rational, so there must be lash, rational laws of motion yeah. that operate. And Johannes Kepler and Galileo, all these guys uh, thought that God was at work and had made things that had order and that the human mind then could, you know, appreciate and examine and investigate this order because it was already there. Well, it's, it's recognizing that the other is, now I'm going to use Kant's language, if you can believe it. Kant was a philosopher, he died in 1804. Yeah. Uh, he, he would say that each of us are a kingdom of ends, that we, we, we transcend in some sense the material reality because there's something more there, that there's intrinsic worth. And, and so when I look to you, there's intrinsic worth that's well beyond you know, the sum total of the way that your uh, physical, a sum total of the way that the uh, physical constituents of you are working together. There's something more than, and you see the same in me. So we are brothers in some sense, that we stand outside of just uh, the mere nature. Uh, the intrinsic worth of the other guy. The, the intrinsic worth, and you know, uh, it is a bit of a mystery. I mean, in the other ages, when it was easy, everyone believed that God created human beings, and uh, and then of course you were uh, of infinite worth because you were a creation of God, and in, in a particular way you were made in the image of God. Yes. Uh, now your your cat wasn't made in the image of God, right? Your dog's not made in the image of God. Well, the my man, dog. Well, my yours. <laughs> Mosquitoes aren't made in the image of God. Well, I can tell you that's the truth. <laughs> <laughs> but, but you are made in the image of God. So there was a, a, a nice, firm way to sort of sort you away from the other animals. See, yeah. you, you had intrinsic value and cats and dogs didn't. Well, you know what's gone on here in the last 40, 50 years about uh, how we were thinking about animals and how the, that line's become more and more blurry. Yes. And indeed, there's one ethicist that accuses human beings of speciesism, that yes. we think of ourselves as being somehow higher than or more worth than other species. Well, once you get rid of this uh, idea that God has uh, made you in the image of God, what does separate you from the higher primates? Why would you have more value uh, than maybe orangutans? Does anyone have more value than any other person or animal or living right. being, well, or maybe not even living being, maybe. Right. Interestingly enough, of course, Aristotle said that human beings have different values. Do you know that? No. How did yeah. he? Explain? Well, he said that uh, a person's value really has to do with their uh, cultivation of their intellectual and moral virtues. So, so one person is more valuable than another well, because? Well, more excellent. They're more developed. That's part of this whole Aristotelian framework that uh, a human being that is more developed than another is a better human being. Somebody is better than the other. Yeah, that's better than the other. And so when Christianity came along, it, of course, challenged that assumption of the ancient world. That, and now, so then all men were brothers and women, too. See? So what about a child? A child hasn't had a chance. So yeah. there's potential for right. being better made in the image of God, has the same value as uh, the person who is working out, you know, early theories of the universe. 
Do you think a farmer is more important than a, than a videographer or a uh, camera person? Or? Well, I'm looking at our camera person here. Well, I couldn't but, think that. But. <laughs> <laughs> a musician. Uh, so they're all important. Doing, yeah, they're all important, yeah. So I think in this, in this country, we really know how valuable farmers are. Right. Right. And you were you are er, were one. Well, and I I still am on my tax returns. I know. Are you? You still have farms. <laughs> yeah. This is a show about physical health, really. But right. uh, this is on call with the Prairie right. Doctor. Right. And we're talking about wellness. Right. Um, uh, in a book that I'm working on right now, I'm writing a book. It's, I hope it's read. Uh, part of it is how to be how to age in a very healthy way and I put three components I mean there's a million books out here right. out there that talks about this but in chapter one I talk about wellness comes out of physical activity it comes out of out of uh, your interaction with your friends and it it comes out of a spiritual sense um, as well as it comes out of a good diet right right but that uh, interaction with friends and that spiritual sense is together. Do you sense that a person who is spiritually um, or philosophically balanced and, and uh, thoughtful uh, would uh, live longer, better, healthier? That's a big question and of course uh one would probably have to go to the empirical research to see if it's actually true and you'd have to define exactly what a philosophical person is or one who is spiritual and then try to somehow correlate this. I can uh, say that there's some science behind it. There is, and I, and I, I know a little bit of it, uh, actually, uh, although some of those studies are challenged by of others. Course. Yeah, yeah, of course. course. But it is interesting. Have you ever thought about our word disease? No. What, did, what? Just think about it. Disease. Dis-ease. Dis ease. Yeah. yeah. And of course that uh, ease had a, a thoroughly existential sort of, you know, con, uh, connotation. Uh, and existential and, and, meaning? Uh, having to do with our fundamental existence, having to do with how we live. Uh, so to be diseased is uh, not to be somehow at home in the world, right? It's to be yeah. out of whack, diseased, to be uh, eased is to be somehow living in uh, harmony or somehow. Yeah. So disease is an out of whackness, out of harmony. and Out it, of whackness, can I quote you on yeah, that? Yeah, you can quote <laughs> So there's a, a, a fundamental spiritual out of whackness, one might say, that can manifest itself physically. Uh, and maybe that was an original connotation. Maybe people thought in some sense that the disease was just a manifestation of the spiritual uneasiness. Uh, and uh, I, I do think uh, that what's very important for human beings is to have something to strive for, uh, to have meaning that's out ahead of them. Um, we call this way of thinking, thinking in terms of eschaton, something that's the end of it all, the last thing, to, to be oriented towards the future, to be striving for something uh, to complete. And that gives, that gives meaning. And it gives, gives zest. It gives and, zest. Yeah, and, and then health. Health. It, it's, it's, I think, how our soul works best, you know, to have something that we're striving for, something to actualize, something to do, something to get up with spring in the step to do the next day. And when, when you have that, then you don't have so much time to turn in and wonder if that little pain is you know, the first, yeah, and and get maybe worse. it's something. And I, I really believe what <laughs> you just said is true. I, I sense that I, I, as a geriatrician, caring mm -hmm. for elderly people mostly, mm -hmm. I see those who have uh, something to do every day, right. live into their 90s many times. I right. mean, they just, they're going, they're working on Habitat for Humanity, they're right. working on, they've got a job, to, a lot of it's volunteer stuff, and it just gives them meaning and direction, and they just stay alive. My, I just got off the phone with my father uh, right before I got on here, and he was out driving the tractor today because they were baling hay. And uh, I had called him earlier. I couldn't really talk to him because he's out, uh, you know, baling running hay. the baler. Yeah. 
he's 92 years old, you yeah. know, and he's out there, and he, <laughs> he'd like to be out there. He said, I wish there was a thousand acres to bail, he told uh, me today. And you love bailing? He loves, he loves, he loves out there. He, uh, every day, he's got something to do. And if we can have that, but, but you know, it, it really comes with a sense that the future is not ultimately our enemy. Yes. If life is a tale of woe told by an idiot filled with sound and fury signifying nothing, in the words of Shakespeare, right? If that's what life is, the future is our enemy. It, 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 it eats us alive, if you will. Yes. It comes upon us. And we're just sitting there sort of like uh, World War I in a trench waiting to be overrun. Right. Overrun by the Huns, you know, the future's Correct. coming in on us. If we can see the future as friendly, we can live through the present yes. with... And the pre present may be tough. No I mean, present, there's, right? no, there's no question. Life right. is not easy. Right, right. Uh, but uh, if we have that future that's friendly, right. uh, so that, that brings us to our final issue, I think, and we should talk about that, and that's dying. I mean, some say that that's the origin of religion, is when they realized that this young boy that was hunting with me uh, after, you know, right. the wildebeest or whatever it was out, out 10, 20, 30, yeah. 40, 70, 80,000 years ago, right. that child is now gone right. and something went away. Right. What was it and gave, you know, and then what is death and what is it all about? Uh, I, I, some would say that uh, religion is um, a a narcotic to ease us into the reality of, of, of uh, to, to give us an answer for what happens when we die and it gives us that comfort of the future. What's your answer to that? I don't think it's a narcotic. Uh, I don't think it's an opium. And you know, uh, of course, Marx famously claimed that religion is the opiate of the masses. Yes, I, him... I didn't mean to say yeah. Marx there. Yeah, I mean. But I yeah, know, but that's, uh, I think it's a map. It's a map into the future. Uh, religion is a map into the future, which includes there being no future. Now, see, the, whenever I, whatever I think and whatever I do, I'm always related to my future. I'm related to what's coming the next day, what I think is going to happen the next day. I, every act, I, every decision I make, everything is related to the future. But there is one future in which, and, and the possibilities for the future, right? right? And then I can do this, I can do that, I might do this, I could still do that. As we get older, we don't have quite as many of those, but, but of course there was one possibility in which there is no more possibilities, and that's death. Right. And that reality of the possibilities of which there are no more possibilities is with us now. And so, I go with a philosopher by the name of Martin Heidegger here who distinguished death from perishing. Perishing is when our bodies die, but, but dying is our lived reality. We live in the shadow of there being no more possibilities for us. Right. That we and know there's a death coming. There's a death coming, and, it, and, and it's experience, even if we're not thinking about it, we, we know it now in a way. And, and so, and many people run with hysteria. Right. They, are, they don't want to talk about it. Right. Don't even bring it up. Uh, and my sense is many of those people have a strong religion, even. I don't, I don't sense that, that religion always gives them succor or safety right. or, or, or uh, hope. Uh, many people are very religious, but they, they, they're, they're run from death. Respond to that. Well, I think... Well, of course, I'm a Christian theologian, but I think Christian theology understands death. I mean, the central theme of Christianity is the cross. It's death. In the midst of life, there's death, but in the midst of death, there's life. It's that overturning. Uh, and so I, I think that uh, in order for us to have a deeply mature view and to be, if you will, finally settled, we have to come to terms with death. And, and I think some people don't want to think it, they run away from it, there's a fear of death. Yes. And yet, if we understand death, it's with us all the time. It's been with us since the beginning. Yes. 
it is our possibility in every moment of our lives. And now, if you're asking what happens when I die, I will say that I don't think God forgets. He does not forget us. He does not forget us when we die. That's how I want to That's your talk comfort. About, yeah, well, yeah. Uh, the fact that we've lived, if it's, you know, William James said that uh, death is the core, you know, uh, it, death is the worm at the core of human pretension to happiness. It's, uh, say that death, again. Death is the worm at the core of human pretension to happiness. Pretension. We, pretension, that we won't try to be happy. I, I don't think it has to be that way. Uh, but here we have to go beyond the physical. There, there is n no way that we're remembered by, you know, Do you remember objects. your great-great-great-grandfather? Do you know who he or she, he was, your great-grandmother? We, we lose them, don't we? We lose them. The question is, God doesn't lose us. Yeah. See? And, it, and that's, that's a great comfort to me, that God does not lose us. Right. I, I sense that as we talked about the beginning of the, the universe and the, 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 the intellectual, the in, intelligent design of it all. I mean, that gives me great comfort. And I do sense that when I've done a good thing, right. it's never lost. Right, right. It's never lost. No, Absolutely. it goes on and on and on. On and on and on. In the beginning was the word, and at the end there is the word. Reason, uh, they are the bookends of history, of, of all that is. We had the opportunity to visit with Dr. G. Scott Morris, who is a Methodist pastor and a medical doctor who has found a spiritual path to providing help to those in need. So the two of us graduated from Emory University School of Medicine in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, and then you went on and did your residency in family practice? Yep, and uh, back in Virginia. Uh -huh. and, uh, but prior to med school, what did you do? So I went to seminary and uh, went to Yale Divinity School and uh, became a United Methodist minister. And then the way I think about myself is I am an, a, a pastor who acquired a particular skill. Um, which was to be a doctor. So you're first a pastor, aren't you? Isn't that interesting? That, that is definitely how I see myself, yeah. Yeah, and so you went to one of the, what drew you to Memphis? So it's hard to believe, but um, I had, uh, over the years, uh, introduced myself to a number of different people who were linking the concept of faith and health um, one day I was in the chaplain's office at the Yale Medical School. I looked on his desk and there was a little pamphlet that said how to start a church-based health clinic. And I go, that's it. That's what I want to do. And then as I finished my education, I wanted to stay in the South. I didn't want to go back to Atlanta. And then, not making this up, I, I read somewhere that Memphis was the poorest major city in America. And, and based on that, I said, I'm going to Memphis. I did not know a single person there. but. That's where I went, and I've been for 30 years. And you've established uh, what, uh, what's happening in Memphis for you. Yeah, so um, I went in 1987, uh, started something that at that point was known as the Church Health Center, now known just as Church Health. And what we do is provide health care for people who work in low-wage jobs who don't have health insurance. We do it in the name of the faith community. So we do this without government, government support. Money. And we currently care for over 70,000 people. So the largest faith-based, privately funded health center in America. Now, if they have insurance or if they have money or they want to pay, you let them pay a certain amount. Yeah, you are not a free clinic. I don't believe in free clinics. Uh, poor people aren't looking for a handout. They're looking oh. for something they can afford. So we uh, charge people according to their income. People give us verification of their income, and we charge on a sliding scale. Now, most people pay about $20 for a yeah, visit. We are 100% focused on the working uninsured and people who are working to make our lives comfortable, that they, they cook your food, they take care of your children, your grandchildren, they wash your dishes, they cut your grass, they one day dig your grave. In Memphis, where we have not expanded Medicaid, you know, none of these people are gonna qualify for anything. 
their, their job doesn't offer right. them health insurance, that they don't qualify for Medicaid, there is no such thing as Obamacare. They're the they're working on their part. Own. They're absolutely they're the working, working for, aren't they? Right. So we have 12 physicians who this is our job. We have a couple of nurse practitioners. The amazing thing is we have a thousand doctors who volunteer with us, um, which is a huge from, thing. From throughout, throughout Memphis? Throughout Memphis, across the board. One of the um, coolest things is what I call my retired doctor phenomena. We have 62 subspecialist physicians who have retired. They go play golf for six months. Then their wife calls me and says, can't you do something with That's him? This guy? <laughs> and uh, we have now put them to work and we have built them a playground. And uh, <laughs> the only way you get to see these doctors who five years ago were thought of as the best doctors in Memphis is at our facility. One of the problems that I see in American health care is that we have not given enough attention toward mental health care. Any comments about mental health? Yes, so I'm a primary care doctor. 50% of people who come to primary care doctors have no medical problem. P people come to the doctor today for reasons they used to come to the priest. So the doctor giving you an extra 15 minutes of his or her great wisdom is not going to solve any problem. A and the pills rarely work. Rarely work. So uh, behavioral health is a huge issue. Uh, the issue of substance abuse is over the pale. And then what we really worry about is dual diagnosis, you know, both the substance abuse and depression. And so which comes first, the depression or the drinking? It is really hard to figure that out. And it cannot be driven just by the physician. So we have behavioral health specialists on our team. We have health coaches. We think issues of diet and nutrition play into behavioral health. So we have a full spectrum of of services at the Church Health Center. Wow. It is a powerful thing to feel called into this type of work. You know, we have a thousand doctors who volunteer with us, but we have you know, many thousands others who volunteer in one other way. What I believe in my heart of hearts is by being engaged with us, either as a volunteer or as a donor, I mean, we have to raise over $20 million of real money every year to do this work. It will make your life better it will drive you personally closer to God. Now you wanna be closer to God, then you ought to be involved in the work we do because this is what God has called us all to do. Church Health in Memphis is the home of an idea known as parish nursing or faith community nursing. We actually today call it the Westberg Institute. Um, this idea has been around for almost 40 years now, started by a guy named Granger Westberg, who was a Lutheran pastor in Chicago who asked the question, wouldn't congregations create a healthier life for people by actually having nurses work in a church? It's actually a brilliant idea. Um, clergy are not very good at dealing with healthcare issues. You know, why not have a nurse as your partner? Now, this is not about checking blood pressure on Sunday morning. This is about helping people live into what the life well lived would look like. So there are actually 18,000 nurses around the world who are trained in this type of work. Um, they've all been trained through a curriculum that we in Memphis control and have designed. Uh, they are so passionate about their work and I've come to realize there are some truly ama amazing nurses here in South Dakota who care deeply about this and uh, everybody listening is probably just a phone call away from a parish nurse. Strictly from a Christian standpoint, a, a third of the New Testament has to do with healing the sick. But whether you're Jewish, Muslim, Hindu, it doesn't matter. Every major faith community for the most part takes the same point of view. Yes. We have an obligation to provide health care for the poor. So what are we doing about it? I mean. Historically, we used to build hospitals that have church names on them. You know, if you want to follow Jesus, you want to be connected to God, the call to discipleship is to do three things, to preach, teach, and heal. You don't get to take a pass on the healing part. Do you really want to look Jesus in the face at the end of time and have him say to you, do you think I was kidding? Did you think I didn't really mean that part of it? I, I personally don't want to do that. You know, and what I think is that if somebody is building my house and they fall off the roof and they break their leg and they're uninsured, we have some obligation to take care of them. We really do. How can we use the spirit within us to help with our well-being? How can we be quiet enough 
to listen to ourselves. What I have tried to do over the last oh, 18 years or so is to teach patients a type of um, mind-body spiritual practice. Sometimes I call it a spiritual stress buster. Um, a pause button for the mind is another kind of cliche term that we use, but um, we believe that our patients have a mind, a body, and a spirit, and that within that spirit there's resources of, you know, things like goodness and wellness and wholeness and those kinds of characteristics. But we can't tap into those until we quiet the mind. To quiet the mind, one of the key components is to be able to train your attention. How do we focus? How do we concentrate? And most of the time, our minds are all over the map. Our thoughts are all over the place, and we're multitasking, and we're speeded up. And so to quiet the mind, one way to do it is by repeating a word or a phrase. In fact, uh, research studies have shown that when a person just does word repetition, the mind quiets down and there's the relaxation response. So the question is, what do you focus on? You're asking me, how would I focus attention? Well, there's a lot of things. You can focus on your breath. You can focus on your emotions or feelings. You can focus on your body, like yoga or tai chi. Uh, you can focus on um, you know, whatever thoughts you have. But what we're talking about is focusing on a special word or phrase, the mantra, or mantra is how most people think of it. When I mean practice it, what I mean is quietly repeating this word or phrase. So it's kind of like lifting weights. If I were lifting weights and I wanted to build a muscle, I would repeat it all the time. I'd go to the gym and I'd do so many repetitions. Well, in order to train your mind to focus so that you can calm yourself, you need to repeat and bring your mind back to the same word or phrase over and over. And depending on your background or your belief system, uh, there's a whole variety of different words that we recommend, um, most of which are traditional and have been handed down for centuries and centuries. These aren't like a slogan. It's not like an affirmation, like I'm lovable and capable, or um, a motto. We're not talking about that. We're actually talking about um, words or phrases like a prayer. Um, I mean, and for some people, um, Christianity, it might be repeating the name of Jesus or Ava Maria or the Hail Mary. In Buddhism, it might be Om Mani Padmi Hum, something like that. In Hinduism, I think it was Gandhi's mantra was Rama Rama, which usually has no associations to anything, but that was his mantra. Uh, Judaism, uh, Baruch Ad Adonai, is another type of mantra, or Allah, in Islam. So the beauty of mantra repetition is that, yes, you can do it at any time or any place that you're not already concentrating. So if you're doing your email, you should be doing just your email, and then when you get up to walk to get your coffee, you could be repeating your mantra the whole way. When you get out of your car in the morning, after you've parked your car and you're going to go into work and you're thinking about all the things you got to do, did I get groceries, do I pay the bill, you can stop for a moment and just repeat your mantra while you're walking into the building. And so what you're doing is bringing yourself almost immediately into the present moment and connecting to a deep inner stillness or calmness, which a person has to practice over time. So initially we say, repeat your mantra as you fall asleep every night. Because as you fall asleep, your body's relaxed and you're pairing that word or phrase with a state of physiological relaxation. So if we look only at the scientific or physiological explanation, we're just looking at a mind-body connection. We are though, wanting to go deeper to the spirituality part of it. And so we believe, as I said, that there are mind, body, and spirit, and we have these inner spiritual resources that we want to tap into, and we can do that through choosing these words or phrases that are more spiritually, you know, defined. I think of spirituality as a search for the sacred or search for meaning. And I think that's kind of a universal 
characteristic in most human beings. Um, religion, I think, comes with a set of guidelines or rules or institutions um, that often overlap with some spirituality. Uh, so I think of religion as being more like an institution that comes with a set of guidelines and recommendations and so forth. Whereas spirituality, I think people can be spiritual like on their own without being connected to a religion. Mm -hmm. That's how I see it. Well, it's true that with any habit or any new technique and particularly a lifestyle change, it's hard to maintain that. Uh, so we, uh, we encourage people to put little sticky notes up around their house or at the bedside before they, to, as a reminder. Uh, we encourage people to write the mantra. They can sit down and write it over and over. Uh, we have something we call mantra art. So you can use different color pens and you know, do that if you like. Uh, but it will take some effort to continually use it and it's important to give yourself those reminders so that it eventually, hopefully, will become a habit. So to find out more about mantra repetition and using this particular method, uh, people can go to the Blue Mountain Center of Meditation website. It's, um, it's bmcm.org. They can also go to my website, which is my name, jillborman.com. And if they Google something, if they go online and you Google it, you just make sure you're using the word mantra with the M and not just mantra. It'll take you different places. And we use the word mantra with a particular focus on spirituality. Um, and people that use mantra, you're going to find slogans and, I mean, you'll find a whole variety of different things. And people are certainly welcome to do that. I, if I recommend the book, uh, The Mantra Handbook. It's a great little um, book that gives all kinds of information about this particular method, The Mantra Handbook, or Strength in the Storm, uh, which is another book uh, written by Eknath Eshwaran. Uh, our veterans loved it. Most people who read these books are very easy to read, um, and you get inspiration. So as you were saying, how do you keep it going? You keep it going by reading inspirational stories and how other people have used this method. And I think that's the best way to keep it going. I think it's important for we as human beings to understand that life happens. Things will happen to us, good things, bad things, things that are completely out of our control. And I think one of the most important things we can learn is that Although I can't control what goes on outside me, I can learn how to manage my reactions to it. And mantra repetition, learning to focus and calm one's mind, can help us regardless of what happens to us. So we can learn to control our reactivity, even though we can't control what happens around us. So what does science have to say about some of these mysteries? Or are the mysteries those of philosophy and inner thought? And the universe is to be explored and explained by science. You know, why I got into physics in the first place was to, to, to learn how the universe works. We can only see back in time so far. So uh, all the cosmological evidence point to a, a Big Bang, uh, that all the matter and energy in the universe uh, originated from a single location. I think the last 20 years has been sort of a revolution in terms of how we see the universe. Uh, first of all, the galaxies are moving faster and faster away from us. Uh, the other is that uh, we know that galaxies rotate faster than they should for the mass that we see. So. Just take the simple example of a mass on a string. If that mass is too large, then the string's going to break and you're going to fly off into some direction. So the black hole is uh, a, a remnant of a supernova kind of explosion. Uh, so the mass of the star is too large. Uh, at some point, the, uh, the star runs out of fuel and instead of being able to 
push against the mass of the star, there's nothing to push back. So there's some good data about the, uh, the number of black holes and maybe the size of the stars uh, that uh, will end up as black holes. Uh, but the actual dynamics inside the black hole uh, is really unknown. The relationship between dark matter and black holes is largely unknown. Uh, obviously, if dark matter is attracted by other mass, it could be around uh, when the star implodes. Uh, dark matter is weakly interacting. It only interacts through gravity, not through electricity. So if you charge particles, they can attract each other. Dark matter could be taken in by the black hole. And what it does inside the black hole, we don't know. I, I think that uh, you know, there's an ongoing discussion about the role of science and religion and how they work together. Uh, I do not think science and religion are incompatible with each other. We decide how we use science. And we can use science in the best possible means to help people. And I think that's where the largest crossover between science and religion is today. Are there energy sources that uh, we don't know of yet in the universe? You know, maybe. I mean, the universe is a big place. And in my opinion, how the universe will end is that uh, eventually stars will burn out. Uh, we will lose the ability to, uh, uh, to generate new stars. And now for the answer to tonight's Prairie Doc quiz question. Pick the best answer. A near-death experience, or NDE, is when, after resuscitation or recovery, a person reports a common experience like an out-of-body feeling, going down a tunnel toward a warm light of peace and well-being, a sense of unconditional love and acceptance, and beings of light or reunion with deceased loved ones. This phenomenon was described, number one, in the early 1500s by a painting by Hieronymus Bosch, two, by French psychologist Victor Egger in 1890, three, by Celia Green, who in 1968 described the out-of-body experience of 400 people, number four, by Raymond Moody, MD, in 1975, who wrote a popular book outlining the phenomenon, five, throughout the ages from all human cultures, or six, all of the above. And the answer is number six, all of the above. We'll be right back after this. On call with the Prairie Doc is very important to a lot of people uh, in this area and in this region because it communicates a lot of very valuable information on health care, medical issues, uh, answer specific questions. The, this project takes dollars. We have people in studios and we have people that have to be paid and we have to do production costs even though Dr. Holmes' time, our time, the guest time is all donated, we still have production costs. We have a great foundation called the Healing Words Foundation that oversees this whole operation and is responsible for some of the fundraising to promote these programs. If you like this program and you enjoy the information you're getting and you find it's valuable, please feel free to go to our website and donate. We would really like to have some additional financial support and it's very simple to do and again it'll keep this program going for the foreseeable future. So the website is prairiedoc.org, O-R-G, prairiedoc.org. Go there, donate if you're so inclined and we thank you very much. Facing my own pancreatic cancer, I've read a few books recently recommended by friends who are lovingly trying to comfort me. A book written by neurosurgeon Eben Alexander has been one of these stories that talks about his near-death experience, or NDE. Alexander developed bacterial meningitis and during a seven-day coma experienced an NDE like many others, but very explicit. He found himself drawn to a warm light while sensing tremendous reassuring comfort. A former skeptic of these stories, he has become a fervent advocate that these experiences, the NDE, are evidence for our connection to all living things, to heaven, and to God. 
His final chapters discuss how inadequate science is in explaining consciousness and suggest that each of us is more than our physical body. Throughout the ages, some of the greatest minds in the universe have addressed the question, what is consciousness? From what source does our awareness come? Where does God fit into that question? Alexander states that the greatest clue to the reality of the spiritual realm is the profound mystery of our conscious existence. As a physician who has practiced for many years, I have tried my best to use evidence-based science to guide me in choosing the best diagnostic and therapeutic options for my patients. I define medical science as a search for truth using double-blinded studies that avoid the placebo effect and preconceived biases. As science advances, we are continuously improving what we can do for people. For example, we can now cure certain cancers that 20 years ago would have killed all those affected. We can now relieve suffering from severe heartburn or from shortness of breath or from a heart that races and from unrelenting depression. I am forever amazed and enthused by continuous improvements in medicine that keep unrolling with proper use of the scientific method. However, with all that method, science has not been able to answer the consciousness question, the spiritual connectedness we can feel toward each other, the question about life after death, and the love and acceptance that many of us sense coming from God or another higher power. I agree with the neurosurgeon. Answers to these questions must come not from science, but from another place. I want to thank Dennis Bielfeld, Jill Borman, Robert McTaggart, and G. Scott Morris for giving us their time for tonight's program. This show wraps up another season for On Call with the Prairie Doc, our 16th year doing this. New programs for next season, starting at the end of August, are already being planned and scheduled. Meanwhile, there will be rebroadcasts of some of our best programs from this season each Thursday until then. Also, a big thank you to everyone who's helped with On Call this season. It's been an eventful year. We thank the underwriters who, through their generous support, make the show possible. The South Dakota State University student crew, they're the pre-med students who help with the phones, the Jaeger Media Center at SDSU, South Dakota Public Broadcasting, and the many, many volunteer doctors who agree to be part of our programs. Thank you. And to you, our viewers, without you, our work is for naught. We all are sincerely appreciative at being welcomed into your homes each week with the message of living well. As I travel about and meet people who are viewers and they tell me how they enjoy our weekly visits, I am touched at the real community and family that has come together around this little television program all these years. As Mark Twain thoughtfully said, kindness is the language which the deaf can hear and the blind can see. That does it for tonight from all of us here at On Call with the Prairie Doc. Until next time, stay healthy out there, people. Major funding for On Call with the Prairie Doc has been provided by. Avera is a proud sponsor of On Call on South Dakota Public Broadcasting. Larson Manufacturing is proud to support on-call television as it continues to open doors for important medical information. And by the South Dakota Foundation for Medical Care, the Medicare Quality Improvement Organization for South Dakota. 
and with the ongoing support of these individuals and institutions. Brookings Health System, Ophthalmology Limited, American Academy of Family Physicians Foundation and South Dakota Academy of Family Physicians. Avera Heart Hospital. Dakota Allergy and Asthma. CoBank. Fishback Financial Corporation. Vance Thompson Vision. Aberdeen District Medical Society. Black Hills Medical Society. Third District Medical Society, Brookings, Madison and Flandreau. Dakota Bank. Orthopedic Institute. Physicians Care, Sanford Clinic, Community Service Committee, and Swift Hell Communications.